Okay, yeah, so I guess we both just kind of wanted to start out here by thanking you all for coming. Uh, this is kind of a weird format to be doing a workshop in, and it isn't what we were maybe initially planning or hoping to do, but given the circumstances, I'm glad that you all managed to make it. And so hopefully, over the next couple of days, what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to show you guys some, some of the basics of X-ray absorption spectroscopy and how you go about uh, designing experiments, collecting data, and actually getting useful information out of those data. And so like Louise said at the beginning, she's going, going to act as the moderator of this uh, session here. And so if you have any questions or want anything clarified throughout these slides, just leave her a note in the chat. And then when she thinks it's a good time, she'll either stop me and ask your question, or she'll unmute you so that you can ask the question. So don't be shy. We'll be, we want to answer any uh, questions that you guys have throughout this. So just to give a little bit of an overview of how things are going to go, we're currently here on day one. Can you see my mouse when I move on the screen, Luis? Uh, yes, I can. And there okay. should be, you should have an option a if pointer. PowerPoint to have a pointer. No, I'll, I'll use my mouse for now. Yes, yeah, that's fine. We can see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we're here on day one. So we're going to start out the day by taking maybe an hour or so to go over just some some basics of XAS. And after we do that, we'll take a little bit of a break. It's also a good time to check to make sure that all of the software that we'll need for the hands-on tutorial works. Uh, then when we come back, Luis. Uh, Luis and I will kind of switch roles a little bit, and she'll be leading you, and I'll be moderating. And then for about an hour and a half or two hours or a little bit more, we'll see how it goes, she'll actually show how to take data that you would collect at a facility like Chess and turn that into useful chemical information that could hopefully answer some questions about uh, science that you guys are doing. Um, the next day, or I guess a week from today, it's a very similar format. The beginning is just uh, some slides at the beginning, a break from the software check, and then another hands-on session where this time, instead of Zane's data, we'll be looking at XAPS data and how that can provide hopefully useful information as well. Then the last day, which will be May 8th, um, we'll start in the morning that day. We'll just have a couple slides on uh, some more practical information of how to go about designing and planning experiments out of Beamline. And then we'll have a little bit of a break. And then the rest of that day is kind of open-ended time, so that if you guys have any you know, lingering questions or you have your own data that you would like help or advice with, Luis and I will be around for pretty much the rest of that day to check in and help in whatever capacity we need to. And also, if we happen not to finish one of the hands-on portions on one of these other days, if we all just get too tired of being on Zoom, we can finish those also in this day. So it's one of the benefits of doing this all online. Their schedule is kind of flexible. So we'll do what we can to accommodate things. So in case you haven't been to chess yet to meet us, I'm Chris Pollock. I'm dis my disembodied head up here at the top. Uh, I'm a staff scientist at the Cornell Synchrotron. Uh, we call the facility chess. So we talk about chess a lot. That's what I'm referring to. Uh, my kind of training and expertise is in X-ray spectroscopy. So doing things like X-ray absorption and X-ray emission and trying to develop uh, new methods with those to see what new information we can use those techniques to get out of chemical systems. And my colleague down here who's co-hosting the meeting with me is Luis. She's a postdoc at CHESS and her expertise is in chemical catalysis and using spectroscopy to learn about catalytic systems. And so together we're hoping to uh, develops new capabilities at chess and to study some really interesting uh, material and catalytic systems. So that's who we are. Um, our goal for this workshop is really just highlighted here at the bottom. And it's to answer any questions that you guys might have about X-ray spectroscopy and how that might help you in your research. Some of the things that we're hoping to cover are basically what are X-ray absorption spectroscopy and XFs, what information do those techniques contain, and how can they help you learn about the material systems that you're studying. Um, we'll also talk about how those experiments are conducted, what kind of samples are required, and how to go about thinking about and planning those types of experiments. And then once you have data, we want to talk about how you, you process that data and how you analyze it 
to go about um, extracting information that you might be interested in. And so those are really the three goals. And you know, like I said at the beginning, please ask questions whenever you have them. That's really our main goal here is to you know, have you guys learn as much as possible in the next couple days about x-ray spectroscopy. So with that, we're just going to jump right in. And you know, the view from 30,000 feet question here is basically what is x-ray spectroscopy and how can it help all of you? And so what you're seeing here is the electromagnetic spectrum on a timeline, basically. And so down here at low energies, we have things like microwaves and radio waves. Coming up higher, you have IR, visible light, X and gamma rays. And so in the spectrum, X-rays are up here at this high energy side. And so to give you a sense of energy uh, in, in electron volts, X-rays are really anything from about 1,000 EV on up to 10, 20, 30, 50,000 electron volts. And for those of you who aren't uh, necessarily uh, so pchem inclined, one electron volt is about 23 kcals per mole. So we're talking about very big changes in energy for this spectroscopy. You know, UV vis is down here at you know, one to five EV, we're at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 times that. So in uh, optical spectroscopy, you're exciting valence electrons in atoms, molecules, and materials. While for x-rays, because they're so high energy, you're exciting core electrons. So these are things like 1s, 2s orbitals. You're exciting electrons out of. And that leads to a lot of really interesting applications and implications that we'll talk about uh, going further here. So some, some of those implications are that these x-ray spectroscopies are inherently element specific. And so what that means is if you have a catalyst, for example, and that catalyst has manganese in it, and the manganese is what you think is doing your chemistry. We can selectively look at what's happening with that manganese atom, even if you have carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and iron and platinum and all kinds of other different elements around, that doesn't impact us at all. We can look at what the manganese is doing and exclude everything else. So it's a very powerful technique in that respect. These are also, because the x-rays are so high energy, they're able to penetrate pretty far into materials. So if you have a sample cell that's like an electrochemical cell where you have some electrolyte around, you maybe have some plastic windows. X-rays are high enough energy where they can penetrate those types of materials, probe the species you're interested in looking at, and then get back out of your sample to get you the information. And so it's very flexible in terms of the, the types of materials and systems that we can study. These are all uh, possible things that we can and have done. Um, there's also the ability to do time resolution. So depending on what the technique is and what the setup is at the beamline, we can get time resolution from seconds even down into milli and microseconds with some specialized equipment. So if you're interested in very fast reactions, these are also amenable to study with X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And then really the most important part of this is really that these techniques allow you to get access to information that is challenging or in some cases impossible to get from other methods. So the reason that you would you know, pack all your samples in a suitcase and fly them to upstate New York when you have all this equipment already in your labs is because the information that we can provide is things that you can't necessarily learn from things available in your lab. So that's why you would want to do techniques like this. So I don't know, um, if any of you are familiar with molecular orbital theory or like band theory, but when we think about the electronic structure of atoms, molecules, and materials, in the simplest sense, what you have is you have a series of you know, filled orbitals or you know, filled bands, beginning down here at the very lowest energy, your core orbitals, on up to the very highest energy, your valence band, your valence orbitals. You then have a, a gap typically, your band gap, and then you have unoccupied orbitals or your conduction band. And even higher in energy, you have basically um, unbound electrons. So, and what we do in X-ray spectroscopy, like I said, it's a very high energy technique. So we use photons to excite core electrons. And we excite those core electrons into unoccupied space. So these orbitals are already filled, we can't put more electrons in them, but we can put electrons into this uh, unoccupied space up here. So when we excite core electrons, we can excite them into these empty spaces. 
And what that does is that gives us a spectrum that will look something like what we're showing over here on the right. And these spectra are divided into three regions. Um, the lowest energy region is what we call the pre-edge. So that's when you excite these core electrons into bound orbitals, these low energy empty orbitals. Those give rise to your pre-edge. When you go higher in energy, you actually ionize this core electron out of the molecule. So you're sending, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> you're sending it all the way up into this continuum. You're ionizing the atom. That gives rise to this very intense edge transition, is what we call it. <clears throat> and if you give even more energy past the edge, you get these weird little wiggles, and those are XFs. And XFs are so weird that we're going to talk about them tomorrow because they're, or not tomorrow, next week, because <clears throat> they're strange enough that they deserve their own talk. So this is you know, what an edge spectrum will look like. Unfortunately, uh, chemists were not the ones to name these kinds of things. Physicists got to name them. And as you can tell from this plot over here, they picked some very strange names. So what we're looking at is essentially the same picture I just showed you with the different orbitals shown over here on the far right side, and then the transitions. And so what this <clears throat> says is that if you're taking an electron that lives in a 1s orbital and you're exciting that, that's a k-edge. <clears throat> if you come up to this L equals 2 level, so the 2s, 2p type orbitals, those are called L-edges because they're from the 2 level. Similarly, from the 3 level, those are called M-edges. That's kind of weird, but you know, those are the names, that's fine, but it gets a little bit more complicated than that even. And you'll see that here for this, like uh, for the n equals two level, you have both 2s and 2ps. And so what that means is you have these little subscript numbers. So you can have an L1, an L2, and an L3. It gets even more complicated for the m edges. Now, I say all of this, most of it is not something that you all will have to concern yourselves with, but I just wanted you to know that when I talk about a k edge, k edges are 1s orbitals. When I talk about l edges, they're almost always from 2p levels. So that's the nomenclature here. <clears throat> so the other thing I mentioned a couple slides ago is that these spectra are element selective. And what I mean by that is that every element's core orbitals, the 1s, 2s, 2ps, absorb at unique energies. So what I'm showing you here is a plot of the atomic number and then the absorption energy for the K edges and the L3 edges in electron volts. And so what you see is that as you go up in atomic number, you get heavier basically for the atoms, the energy it takes to excite these core electrons goes up and it goes up roughly parabolically. Thankfully, there's enough separation between each of these points that we can selectively excite one atom without exciting the ones around it. Um, if we zoom in a little bit, a lot of the elements that uh, people are most interested in as far as doing reactions are metals, transition metals, lanthanides, those kinds of things. And so what I'm showing you here is the energy range from 4,000 electron volts to 16,000 electron volts. And this is the energy range that our beam line at CHESS can easily get to. And so what you'll see is you'll see that the elements that fall within this window our atomic number basically 20 to about 40, and most of those are the first row tra transition elements. So our beam line can easily access all the first row metals that could be doing interesting chemistry. Also within that window for the L edges are, you see that there's a lot more dots in here because the L edges are a lot uh, closer spaced together, but here we have everything from about the end of the second transition row all the way through your actinides. So up to uranium and other elements that you don't really want to be studying because they're nasty. <laughs> so <clears throat> what you will also see is there's kind of a gap in here, which I'll show you in a second. So if we look at this on a periodic table, our, our beam line at chest can technically get from four to about 58 keV. And so on a periodic table, everything colored in red is a K edge that we could access. <clears throat> everything in purple is a K and L edge and everything in blue is an L edge. Now, we typically don't operate up to 58 keV. That takes some technical uh, finagling to make happen. So like I said, we typically go from more like four to 16. And so that still enables access 
to the elements you show you see highlighted here. So the take home message here is basically that <clears throat> even under this uh, more restrictive configuration, we can still access a lot of elements that are interesting to chemists and material scientists. You'll also notice that there's this kind of uh, empty island in the second transition row where the K edges are too high to reach and the L edges are too low to reach. And that's a problem that many beamlines actually have. It's not just us. The second transition row is quite challenging to study with X-ray spectroscopy at most facilities. And so even though things like, you know, ruthenium and molybdenum can do some interesting chemistry, they're hard to access. So just keep that in mind, <coughs> sorry, when you're planning experiments. Okay, so we'll go over a little bit more nomenclature and then we'll dig in. So like a lot of absorption type spectroscopies, XAS is governed by what we call the dipole selection rule. And in non-physicist speak, what that means is that a photon has an angular momentum of one. And so when an atom or molecule absorbs that photon, the atom or molecule has to undergo a delta L of plus or minus one because you have to conserve angular momentum. So what does that mean? Well, when you look at orbitals, they all have their own L values. So the S orbital is L equals zero, P is L equals one, D is L equals two, F three, and so on. So if you have an electron that's sitting in an S orbital, S equals, or L equals zero, when it absorbs a photon, it can only go up to um, L equals one. So it can only go from S to P. If you have an electron in a P or, so this would be like for doing a K edge, if you have a, a one S electron, it can only go into empty P orbitals. If you have an electron in a P orbital, we can now go plus one to end up in L equals two D orbitals or minus one to go into L equals zero S orbitals. So if you're doing an L3 edge, you can have transitions both to D and S orbitals that are possible. D orbitals is the same thing, F orbitals is the same thing. So this kind of just summarizes what I was talking about. So now we have some nomenclature under our belt and we can start digging in to what these spectra are actually trying to tell us. So in part one, we're going to start with the edges, which are conceptually probably the most simple in terms of how they happen and what information you can get out of those. So does anyone have any questions at this point? If there are no questions, Luis, just tell me no and I'll go on. Yeah, I don't see any questions so far. Okay. okay. So we'll start very basically. When we're measuring a K edge, for example, what are we doing? Well, what we're doing is we're hitting a 1s electron with enough energy to ionize it. So the energy difference between this orbital and an ionized state is the edge energy. And so in a very simple picture, if we were scanning the incident energy that we're hitting this 1s electron with, we would see nothing happen, nothing happen, nothing happen because we're too low, we would hit this energy difference and we would see a big jump in intensity because now we have enough energy to ionize that electron. You can see this step and then if you give it any more energy, nothing different happens because it's enough to ionize it and nothing else is going to change. You have this very nice step function. Unfortunately, we live in the real world and that's not quite so simple because the first thing we have to contend with is Heisenberg, the uncertainty principle. And what Heisenberg tells us is that the energy resolution, delta E, times delta T has to be greater than or equal to this. And so the delta T here is the lifetime of the excited state. So when you excite a 1s electron out of an atom, that leaves a hole in your 1s orbital. And as you can possibly imagine, a 1s hole is not a very stable state. That 1s orbital very much wants to be filled with electrons. And so within a very short period of time, it will grab an electron from somewhere else in your molecule and fill itself. Uh, the time scales here are femtoseconds or shorter. So these are very short lifetimes. And unfortunately, delta T is very, very small, which means that delta E has to be relatively big. And so the resolution of X-ray absorption measurements are dependent largely on how long that 1s whole state can stay around. And the impact that that has on the spectra is it takes this nice step function that we started out with and it broadens it out. So it turns it into something that looks more like an arc tangent than a step. Okay, so what else can we do here? Well, if we happen to change the energy of this 1s orbital around, we move it up or we move it down, 
Well, that changes the amount of energy that we need to hit this electron with to ionize it. So if we're starting with this guy and we move the 1s lower, we now need to hit it with more energy to ionize it. So what that would do is that would uh, shift the edge to higher energy. So <coughs> what we would have is a picture like this. So we have this first guy is the absorption edge at lowest energy. Next higher is higher and higher still. So we can change the energy position of this edge based upon the energy we need to excite. Now, again, this is still a very simple picture. And so let's build up one more level of complexity, which is that we don't just have the ability to ionize 1s electrons. We typically also have occupied and unoccupied orbitals also hanging around on this atom or molecule. And so, like we said before, if you have any unoccupied orbitals, anything in your conduction band, you can excite the 1s electrons into those states as well. And so what this gives you is this gives you the possibility for additional absorption peaks on top of these arctangents. So it could give you something that looks like this. So you have a small one at lowest energy, a big one at higher, and then you have your absorption edge. And at this point, we had this little cartoon, which actually looks not so far away from what an actual spectrum looks like. So this is conceptually what I want you to be thinking about when you look at edges. This is what we're doing. We're mostly, the, you have this big edge jump, which is ionization, and superimposed on that are transitions to orbitals or your conduction band. So let's look at what this can tell us. <coughs> the first piece of information I've already kind of hinted at, which is it can uh, tell you about the oxidation state of the atom that's absorbing. And the reason for that, or I guess before we get into the reason for that, we'll just look at these spectra. We have the black is manganese two, the red is manganese three, and the blue is manganese four. And so what you can see is that as the oxidation state increases, the edge shifts to higher energy. So you start out down here, you know, 6550 or so, and you creep on up to 6555. Now, what's the reason for that? Well, if we come back to looking at our orbitals again, we have this cartoon for manganese 2. If you were to oxidize manganese 2 to manganese 3, what that does is so you remove an electron from the manganese. That means that you have the same number of protons in that manganese nucleus and one less electron. <coughs> so you have more positive, you have the same positive charge and less negative charge. So the positive nucleus will grab onto and hold the remaining electrons even tighter. So what that means is that when you go to manganese 3, these 1s electrons, which are already very close to the nucleus, are being held even tighter. So it lowers that orbital even more in energy, and it makes the gap between this continuum and the orbital even bigger. So you need more energy to excite it, and your edge shifts to higher energy. Keeps happening with manganese 4. So edges tend to be a very good probe of what the oxidation state is of a, a metal center, or really any atom in a molecule. As an example of this, here was a, a reaction where someone started out with a manganese 2 compound, and they mixed some stuff in there, and they weren't quite sure what happened at the end. And so we collected this data, and it turns out that the edge for the, the product compound was shifted by a couple of electron volts to higher energy. And so what that was telling us is that when this reaction was happening, their manganese was actually being oxidized. So edges are very good at probing these kinds of changes in a system. We can even get more complicated than that. And here's an example from a paper by uh, Abrunia here at Cornell. And he actually put an electrode in our beam line. So he had some kind of uh, a manganese species here, it turns out again, on an electrode. He applied a potential to that. And we basically just watched what happened to the edge spectrum. And as the potential was applied, we saw that the edge shifted in this direction to lower energy. Whoops skipping ahead. <laughs> so we see that with whatever uh, electrochemical changes are happening, we know that the manganese in the system is being reduced. And so this can be very useful if you have an electrode or a catalyst or a fuel cell or something like that that has many different metals in it, you know, manganese, cobalt, iron, platinum, and you're not sure which one, if any, are going through redox changes you can collect the edges and you can see which one changes based on potential. And that will give you a very good idea of which one is actually doing the chemistry or the reaction that you're looking at. Now, 
if everything were this simple, it would be, you know, everyone would be doing edges, but there are some complicating things to keep in mind that I want to tell you guys about. So the first is that I said back at the very beginning, uh, XAS is a bulk sense, is a bulk, yeah, is a bulk probe. And so when you look at your sample, you will see all, el all atoms of that element in your sample. So this example I'm showing you here, <coughs> it had two different kinds of manganese in it. It had about 35% manganese 2, and it had about 65% manganese 4. And the resulting spectrum that you get is a sum of those two different manganese oxidation states. So this can be very useful if you have a system and you want to look at everything present in it, but it's also something to keep in mind because if you have you know, a catalyst and only a small amount of that catalyst is doing a reaction, you'll be seeing both the active and the inactive catalyst in these reactions. So you have to keep that in mind when analyzing the spectra, because if a lot of your element isn't changing, the effects you see will be, will be very small. Similarly, when you know, we said that edges are very good probes of oxidation state, and that's true, but it's, uh, we need to keep in mind that what I've done here is basically taken um, everything from 100% manganese 2 and all the way to 100% manganese 4. These are the two species I was mixing. And what you can see is the position of the edge does increase as you get closer to manganese 4, but that is not a linear increase. There's actually very little that happens going to manganese 2 to manganese 3, and then a big shift happens going from manganese 3 to manganese 4. So you might be able to see changes in oxidation state, but don't assume that that change is going to be linear, because in many cases it won't be. Okay, so this is a slide where I wish we could be in person, because I could ask the audience what they thought. Um, but here I'm showing you the, the red spectrum is iron 3 chloride, you know, right here in the middle. There's also a blue spectrum and a black spectrum. So this red one is iron 3, and I would love to be able to ask you guys, what oxidation states do you think the blue and the black spectrum are? If you're just looking at these spectra, you might think, okay, the blue spectrum is lower energy, that might be iron 2. The black spectrum is higher energy, maybe that's iron 4. Unfortunately, that's not the case in this, for, these, uh, for this example. These are all iron 3, and yet the edges show up over a span of about 8 electron volts. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that, you know, like we've seen with those uh, simple orbital pictures, the edge energy is really just the difference in energy between the 1s orbital and the continuum, the, the ionized state. So anything that influences the energy of that 1s orbital will shift the edge around. And fluorine, as many of you probably know, is much more electronegative than the other halogens. And so it's more electronegative, it's pulling the electrons of that iron away from the iron. The iron looks more oxidized than it really is. And so that leads to a very high energy edge. Bromine, on the other hand, is very big, it's fluffy, it doesn't care if it has its electrons or not. And so the iron can grab onto the bromine's electrons a lot more. By doing so, that 1s orbital comes up in energy, it doesn't look like it's as oxidized, and so the edge shifts to lower energy. So this is something to keep in mind when you're looking at spectra. One last example here is, <clears throat> again, we have the familiar iron 3 chloride, and then there's this light blue spectrum where the edge is coming to a little bit higher energy. I'd ask you guys, what oxidation state do you think this is? And to give the answer away, this species is iron pentacarbonyl. So this actually has iron in a formally zero oxidation state. So this blue spectrum is actually more reduced than the red one is. And again, the reason is the same as it was for the halides, because <clears throat> carbonyl is a very good electron withdrawing ligand. It can pull the electron density away from the iron and make it look more oxidized than it really is. So the take-home message with showing you guys all these caveats is not to try to be confusing or try to show you that edges can't tell you anything. They can. It's to make sure that you're careful when you're assessing what the edge is telling you. So what you can't do is you can't just take an edge and based on the energy say, ah, this has to be manganese 4 because of the energy. You can't do that because many things can affect that. What you can do is you can take 
uh, related species. So if you have like an electrode and you vary the potential, you know that you know, most of the atoms in that electrode are going to stay the same, just the oxidation state may, might change. And so in cases like those, you can see, uh, you can interpret uh, edge shifts to be changes in oxidation state. So it's just use them, but be careful. So this is the end of the edge section. Does anyone have any questions before I move on to pre-edges? So I don't <laughs> see any questions yet. Do you have any questions, Luis? No, I think I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna move on to pre-edges. So like we saw a couple slides ago, if you zoom hold in- on, Hold on, there's a, there's a question. Okay, um, good. I like questions. Let me... Um, do you want to, uh, you guys, if you want to ask questions, you can unmute yourselves and ask. We have time now. Oh, okay. So before you move on, uh, I was wondering about the slide where you showed the edge and it's, com it's a combination between 65% and 35%, something of yeah. that nature. This one. Yes. So how do you decompose your edge <clears throat> between those? So what type of analysis do you do when you do those? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So for this example, we actually had other experimental data that told us what the distribution was. So we did it that way. Another way that you can do it is if you have examples of the pure manganese 2 and the pure manganese 4 spectrum, you can collect both of those, and then you can do a linear combination of those two and see what matches your experimental data. So for those linear combinations, um, then the standards should have been, oh, they have to be taken with the same line, right? Yes, they do. And it's also worth noting that those linear combinations work very well in cases where there are limited uh, different possibilities for what the mixture could be. Like it's, I've seen lots of papers where these geologists will come and they'll, they'll bring a rock to the beam line and they'll smash this rock up and they'll take a spectrum of it. And it'll be some you know, mixture of you know, iron two, three, and four. And they'll measure three different iron standards and they'll sum that up and they'll be like, okay, this combination matches the edge. And that's great, except you can have a lot of different iron compounds in rocks, not just necessarily the three examples that they measured. So it's something to be careful about. In, in a lot of material systems, it's much better controlled than that. So you can actually do this a lot better than the geologists can. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. And then the other question that I had was, um, so <laughs> I guess I forgot my question. <laughs> okay. You know what, that, continue, carry on. If I remember, I'll write it on the chat. Thank you so much. No, no, sounds good, thank you. Okay. Let's I think see. there may have been one more question. Did anyone else want to ask something? Hey. Hi, Chris, good morning. Hey, good morning. Hi. We're good, good with every time in this. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Oh, good afternoon, actually. So, uh, Chris, I have a couple of questions. Yes. Okay. Uh, is it possible you can go to slide number 17, please? Yes, I can. This one. Uh, yes, please. Actually, I have a very uh, layman question. Okay. Uh, let's say we excite one atom from the valence band to the conduction band. Mm -hmm. So there is a three possibility as you saw. Uh, so what exactly this spectrum is? Because when you excite the, the, it tells you the energy it absorbed to go to the higher energy levels or because I understood these energy levels are not stable or metastable, and they have to de-excite back to the conduction uh, valence band. Okay, so you're talking about cases where you've done an excitation from the valence band into the conduction band, and then you've done a K edge. Is that correct? Uh, yes. So yes, my question okay. is, so this spectrum, it looks like the left-hand side is very symmetric, out and uh, the right-hand side, the higher energy, it's very spread out with a tail. Mm -hmm. So what is the exact representation of this spectrum compared to the excitation process? What is the representation of the spectrum? Yeah, what this spectrum exactly tells you? It tells you how the, how when you excite an electron, it goes, I, I feel it goes to the like a conduction band or the stark levels 
one of the blue lines or the top of the blue lines mm -hmm. or but it cannot stay there forever the no, no, it definitely, <laughs> yes no so within <laughs> typically within for transition metals a fraction of a femtosecond a higher lying electron will fill or will decay to fill that uh, 1s hole typically what happens is you'll have a 2p electron will fill that hole which will give you a 2p hole which will get filled by higher electrons and within a femtosecond or you know a few femtoseconds it will have cascaded back down to get you back to the ground state okay so the whole process is represented in this spectrum am i correct yeah so the spectrum will include you know any transient you know valence level excitations anything like that will be included in the k edge and so what you could do is people definitely do uh, like laser pump x-ray probe type measurements where they'll pump their system with a laser to do some valence excitation and then they'll hit it with the x-ray pulse to see what the k edge looks like in that excited state okay hey the second question why these peaks are not symmetric because if you look at the first part it goes like like a gaussian type but when it comes back this part the second part after the peak it is very broad it's not coming to the the same base like the beginning of the peak yes no that's a that's a very good question and that's <clears throat> the reason you see this this nice sharp peak is that is likely a transition to one of these occupied or, or one of these unoccupied orbitals. So it'll give you a nice Gaussian shape, but it's sitting on top of that arc tangent like function, which is the absorption of the 1s into this continuum, the ionization transition. So that's why, so you have a peak, but it's sitting on top of an arc tangent. Does that make sense? Uh, well, I think so. Much. Okay, if I go back to this, the tiny peak, it looks like a symmetric. It is going to the and coming back to the same level. So it's a complete a process. Okay, you said the absorption or emission process. But this case is like a is staying very high from the ground ground state energy. From the base energy. Are you are you talking about these intensity? Oh. Yeah, I well, yeah, this one. So these are pre-edges, which I'll talk about in just a couple minutes. <laughs> Okay. So that's a preview of coming attractions. <laughs> My final question is what information we get from this peak shape or size or the full width half maxima? Is there any information we can extract from these peaks or simply we look for the peak energy? Yeah, so that's another very good question. And unfortunately, the edges, there's a lot happening in the edges because you have a, you're producing a very low energy photoelectron and so you have electronic absorption happening you have scattering happening so there's a lot of complex things that happen to give it these shapes so most of the analysis is simply phenomenological looking at relative changes in the position okay from the top is right from what i didn't hear that sorry okay. the relative position change in the from the peak position well, so it depends. You, oh, can, okay. you can measure the peak, you can measure the inflection point, you could measure, you know, the intensity at half of the maximum. There's a couple of different ways that you could get the position out. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay. Are there any Sorry, other questions? My question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's recall some questions. Uh, I remember my question. So my question was uh, about the bulk and the, because you did say this is a bulk and need X-ray yes. penetrating, right? Yes. Um, let's say we have a quartz particle. Can are you able to pick up when you do the linear combination? Will you be able to pick up what's in the surface relatively to what's in the bulk, or it depends? I'm guessing the answer is depends on the shell, right? It depends on the size. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so that is the. Uh, we'll talk about that kind of a system in the experimental talk. In I think that's next week. Because that, 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 that actually presents a couple of interesting experimental challenges for interpreting. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah.
Okay, is there anything else, Luis? I don't see any other questions. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so now we will move on to pre-edges. <clears throat> so, like you've seen in a lot of these spectra now, <clears throat> in addition to that intense edge jump, you also have these lower intensity transitions that are off to lower energy. And so, what are those? <clears throat> well, so <clears throat> what I've done here is I've shown, again, this electronic structure cartoon. But what we need to do is we have to look at this a little bit in a little bit more detail to figure out what the pre-edges actually are. So, whoops, okay, I have an animation there. That's exciting. So <laughs> if you look at this in a little bit more detail, amongst these occupied and unoccupied orbitals, you have your d orbitals. So from <clears throat> For most transition metals, uh, <clears throat> these d orbitals are uh, partially filled and partially empty. So you have you know, some occupied, some unoccupied. And <clears throat> if, <clears throat> oh, sorry. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> you might remember back from one of the beginning slides where I said that if you're exciting an s electron, that can only go to p orbitals. And these are d orbitals. So what am I going on about here? Well, it turns out that those rules were you know, they're 90% right, but they're, you can bend them a little bit. And so in addition to the delta L equals plus or minus one selection rule, there's also a delta L equals plus or minus two selection rule. The one is called dipole and the two is quadrupole. And so according to the quadrupole selection rule, you actually can do 1s to 3d. The caveat is that those transitions are inherently by the factor of 100 weaker than dipole. So that explains a lot of why the pre-edge is so much weaker than the edge, because you, you're already fighting a factor of 100 lower inherent intensity. Now, the pre-edges can gain a little bit of intensity in certain symmetries when p and d orbitals can mix, which we'll talk about quite a bit in some coming slides. But this is the rough origin. Pre-edges are typically 1s to 3d transitions. Okay, so what can pre-edges tell you? <clears throat> well, similar to edges, they can tell you about the oxidation state of the atom that's absorbing. So if you remember back to that cartoon a couple of slides ago, we had the 1s orbital moves quite a bit when you change oxidation state. And the d orbitals will move a little bit, but not quite as much. So what that means is that it takes more energy not only to ionize a 1s electron, but also to excite it into the 3d orbitals. And so in this plot over here, what we're seeing is we have an iron-4 compound, an iron-5 compound, and an iron-6 compound. And as you increase the oxidation state, you need more and more energy to do that transition, and the peak shifts to higher and higher energy. You'll also notice that the intensity goes up as you go from iron-4 to iron-5 to iron-6. And there's a couple different mechanisms that cause that, but the most simple is you, as you oxidize the metal, you have less electrons in the d orbitals, you have more holes, so you have more places that you can send that 1s electron. You know, iron 4 is d4, iron 5 is d3, iron 6 is only d2, so in iron 6 you have eight unoccupied d orbitals, in iron 4 you only have six. So the transition gets more intense because you have more places to put it. Um, as you go higher in oxidation state, you also have uh, more mixing between the p and d, and so the intensity will go up according to that, too. <clears throat> so they can tell you oxidation state. Pre-edges can also tell you about the symmetry of the absorbing atom. And the reason for this is that in certain symmetries, your p and your d orbitals cannot mix. If you've had group theory, I'll explain in a couple of slides why that is. But even if you haven't, just know that in some symmetries, they can mix. And in some symmetries, they're forbidden from mixing. In cases where they're forbidden, the only way pre-edges can have any intensity is because of those quadrupole transitions, those very weak factor of 100 less intense transitions. That's the only place they can come from. In symmetries where they can mix, not only do you have the quadrupole, you also have a tiny amount of P of S to P character, and so they'll gain intensity that way. Um, it doesn't take a lot of P character because they're a factor of 100 uh, times greater than the 1 S to D inherent intensity. So even very small differences in mixing can give you big differences in pre-edge intensity. So this example up on the top here is a six-coordinate iron compound. And that same compound, after it's lost the ligand, 
So it's gone from an octahedron to a square pyramidal geometry, and you see that the intensity has jumped way up. So pre-edges are very sensitive means of uh, saying what the local symmetry, the local geometry is about an absorbing atom. Um, similar thing is shown down here in the plot at the bottom. You have this dark green spectrum is octahedral iron three chloride. It's very low because your P and your D can't mix. This is only quadruple. Whereas your red spectrum is again iron three, again chloride, but it's a tetrahedral. And in tetrahedral symmetry, the P and the D can mix. And so you get your quadrupole transition and also a bunch of S to P type characters. So it, the intensity goes way up. Um, an example of where this was used is <clears throat> someone had some model compounds that had manganese in them and they were bridged by these two oxygen atoms. And what it turned out that the synthetic chemists could do is they could protonate one or both of these OH groups. And as a measure of if that had happened or not, you could look at the pre edges and it turns out that if you don't have any protons on the core, you have a fairly intense pre-edge because the symmetry is such that it allows some P to D mix. As you protonate it, you lose uh, some of that symmetry. And as you protonate it again, you lose even more. So the intensity of the pre-edge was a way to um, assess what was actually kind of a subtle geometric effect um, occurring at the metal center. So pre-edges are very powerful in the, uh, this kind of a capacity. Now, I want to dig in a little bit into this symmetry argument because it can be a little counterintuitive sometimes, and it, it helps to kind of have an intuitive um, idea of what will or will not give you an intense pre-edge. So <clears throat> I think I may have mentioned this before, but it's in, <clears throat> in molecules that are rigorously centrosymmetric, the P and the D can't mix. Now, what do I mean by this? <clears throat> what I mean by this, so we'll, we'll use this D orbital as an example, this one over here on the left. If you start up here in this lobe <clears throat> and you cross the origin, so you start up here, you cross the origin, and you come over to the other side. You've started out in a lobe that's shaded, you've crossed, and you've come into another lobe that's shaded. That <clears throat> means that this orbital is symmetric about the origin. Um, it was some German guys who figured this out, and so they called the symmetry gerada, and they, you know, G labeled. So if you ever heard of EG and T2G, that's where the G comes from, because the D orbitals are symmetric about the origin. Similarly, if you start in one of these white lobes, you end up in another white lobe across the origin. In P orbitals, uh, the case is a little bit different. If you start up here in one of these shaded lobes, and you come down across the origin, you end up in a lobe that is not shaded. So this is not symmetric. This is asymmetric with respect to the origin. Again, it was the same German guy, so they called this ungerada, or anti-symmetric, and they're labeled U. So now, in a rigorously centrosymmetric molecule, what happens is the, if you were to try to add a P and a D orbital together, so I've taken a P orbital and I've overlaid it to this D orbital. This uh, P lobe is shaded on top, and it overlaps with some shaded D and some unshaded D. Those will completely cancel out and you have no net overlap. The same thing happens on the bottom. You have unshaded is adding a little bit with unshaded, but subtracting some with the shaded. And so you have, again, no net overlap. It's, this is kind of a pictorial way of assessing what, they, what I mean by saying P and D mixing. So in in certain symmetries, you're adding things like this, and you have no net overlap, so the P and the D cannot mix. <clears throat> Here are some example molecules that we can try to apply this to. So we'll start with this uh, hexachloromanganate. So it's a manganese, and it's got six chlorides around it. If you start at one chloride and you cross the molecule, you end up at another chloride. So that's symmetric. You start with this chloride, you come across, it's also symmetric. This guy, also symmetric. So this molecule is rigorously centrosymmetric. The D and the P orbitals cannot mix. If we come over to iron pentacarbonyl, starting up here, you have a CO, you cross the metal, you end up with another CO. For this CO, you cross, and uh-oh, you don't end up at another CO. In this case, you end up between these two. Same thing with this one, you end up between. This one, you end up between. 
So iron pentacarbonyl is not rigorously centrosymmetric, and you will get PV mixing, and it will have an intense pre-edge. Um, these two platin compounds, uh, as an example, or it's cisplatin, you start with chlorine, you come over, you hit a nitrogen, nitrogen hit a chlorine, this is not centrosymmetric, you will, you will have an intense pre-edge because the B and the B can mix. Transplatin is the opposite, chloride to chloride, nitrogen to nitrogen, centrosymmetric, no mixing. This tin compound you can do the same thing on. It's centrosymmetric, you won't have very strong mixing. If you've had group theory at all, <clears throat> there's a shortcut to being able to see this. If I put these tables up and you have no idea what these are, if these look great to you, that's fine. I simply put this up for the people who have it and who know what uh, all this means. If you look in the character table, in this column here, you'll see listings for the x, y, and z functions. Those are the functions of the p orbitals. In the next column, you'll have functions that look like d orbitals, z squared, x squared minus y squared, x, y, x, z, y, z. In the case of octahedral, the p and the d occur in different lines. So what that means is that in no cases can they ever mix. So in octahedral, p and d can't mix. You have low intensity pre-edge, which is what we saw back for those iron spectra. In tetrahedral, again, we have the p and the d orbitals, but now they occur in the same line. Because they're in the same line, that means that they can mix and you will have an intense pre-edge, which is why the tetrahedral iron chloride did have an intense pre-edge. So kind of a shortcut if these kinds of tables mean anything to you. Okay, so one last note here before we move on from pre-edges, which is, you know, we're, we're looking at this in a very simple picture. So we're saying that pre-edges are 1s to 3d transitions. And if that's true, a d0 compound like TiO2, <clears throat> you would expect, you know, all of your d orbitals are empty. So you would expect there to be two transitions, right? You know, to the T2G and the EG. But if you zoom in, what you see is that there's actually about four transitions. There's this guy, this shoulder, this peak, this peak. So there's a lot more than there should be given that very simple picture. And the reason for that is because pre-edges are not, strictly speaking, only 1s to 3d. There's atomic multiplet effects that come into play. And we're not going to get into this because for the analysis that most of you want to do, this won't matter. But my own PhD advisor, uh, she worked with Ed Solomon and so she did a lot of this. And so she would not be very happy with me if I did not present this to you guys. So if this is something you're interested in, this is a great paper to read to check that out. If it isn't, don't worry about it. It simply complicates things. Okay, so then the last thing that we'll talk about is all of this that I've shown you has been for first row transition metals, manganese, iron, cobalt, those type things. <clears throat> well, you also have pre-edges for uh, the lanthanides. So for a lanthanide L edge, um, this would be a 2p to, uh, a 2p to 5d, yeah, a 2p to 5d transition is the edge. But you'll notice that you have a little pre-edge, which is actually a 2p to 4f transition because that's also a delta L equals two. Now, most people don't ever do any analysis of these types of pre-edges, but in case I had any lanthanide fans in my audience, I wanted to show them this simply to show that I wasn't ignoring those poor lonely lanthanide metals. So as a take home message um, <clears throat> about edges and pre-edges, the edges are, or the, all the spectra, they're element selective. You can apply them to almost every element, just not those uh, second row transition metals that are beam line. And you can use lots of sample environments. Uh, the edges are sensitive to oxidation state and the pre-edges are sensitive to mostly geometry and symmetry. So I'll spend the last couple of slides talking about how the, or what exactly are some things that we do with data to get useful information out. But before we move on to that section, are there any questions? Um, I don't see any questions. There's one person mentioning that they do work on lanthanides. I'm glad I put that slide in. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> okay. Oh, someone has a question. Uh, okay. You can unmute yourself. Let me find them. They're hiding. <laughs> Okay. Did anyone? Uh, I don't know. Oh, are you ready? Yes, to sir. 
Okay, you are muted. Okay, hi, Chris. That's great. Uh, could you please go back to one or two slides before the last slide? This one. Hey, uh, I can't see your slide. Okay, okay. Now I can see. Is this the one you wanted? Uh, yes. Can you please uh, remove that uh, animation? Uh, okay. I feel when you excite one electron to the conduction band or higher energy levels, when they will de-excite, where, where they are coming from? They will come to the edge of the conduction band before the de-excitation before the de excitation or they will jump out from where they landed at the beginning. No, okay, so <clears throat> let me pull the okay, okay so th this one. You, yeah, so you you've done an excitation. You've excited one of these electrons up here into the conduction band. Okay. What most often happens is you have an electron in a 2p orbital that will fall down to fill that. And the reason it's usually 2p is again because of that dipole selection role. If you want to fill an s orbital, it needs to come from a p because of delta l equals one. You know, other things can happen and do happen, but by far the most common is 2p to 1s, what they call k alpha transition. Does that answer your question? Hey, okay. What I'm wondering is, let's say you excite one electron from one S, mm -hmm. there is a probability it can go to the bottom of the 3D or yes. it can go mm -hmm. to the top. Okay. But when it will de excite, let's say it landed on the higher energy level, this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when this, this cannot stay there forever. Okay. So when it will de excite, it will de excite from that state all the way to the ground state or it will jump to the lower states. Then it will come to the edge of the conduction band, which I think, what is the conduction band by the way here? I'm slightly yeah. confused. Yeah, so there, almost all of the time, there are multiple transitions to get back to the ground state. So in this example, your conduction band would be right below. So like everything would be filled below the 3Ds and then this is the beginning of the conduction band. Okay. 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 Thanks. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Any other questions? I don't think so. No more. Okay. So I've told you all of these wonderful things that edges and pre-edges can tell you. And so hopefully now I'll be able to tell you a little bit about how you can convert data into that kind of information. So <clears throat> you've collected lots of data and now you want to publish it. So what do you do? Well, there are three main steps that people take for uh, turning data into papers. The first is to process the data that comes off the beamline. So you basically take the raw data coming out of your detector and you turn that into something that can be interpreted. You then take that process data and for Zanes and XFs, you typically fit that data. And so it's basically figuring out the precise positions and intensities of the different transitions that have happened to give you that spectrum. And then once you have the, the, those statistical data, what you can do is you analyze them and you can use the numbers to pull out chemically useful information like oxidation state, geometry, etc. So we'll start with processing. What is processing? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> a little, little bit of math, unfortunately. So transmission and fluorescence, I didn't, I haven't talked at all about transmission or fluorescence yet. Wow, okay. Well, as a preview for next week, there are two different ways you can collect X-ray absorption spectra. One is in transmission mode, where you basically shoot X-ray straight through your sample. The other is in fluorescence mode, where you hit your sample with X-rays and you monitor the fluorescence that the sample gives off. Those data are treated in two different ways. For transmission, you use this equation. For fluorescence, you use that one. Since I haven't talked any more about these, we'll save further discussion until next week. <laughs> Okay, so then at that point, after you've applied those equations, all XIS data is the same. So that's nice. So for most of the systems that people are interested in looking at, a single 
scan to collect an X-ray absorption spectrum is not enough to get good statistics, particularly in those low intensity pre-edges. So what generally happens is people have to average data, average many scans together to get nice looking data. And so I put this slide up here simply to say that the signal to noise scales as the square root of the number of scans. So if you have one scan and you want to double the signal to noise, you have to take four scans to increase that by a factor of two. And what this means is that if you have a very weak signal or a very dilute sample, it can take many hours, many, many, many scans to collect nice looking data. I've measured samples where it's taken 48 continuous hours of scanning to get good data. And that was just under a thousand scans. So it can be painful. But the good news is that you can turn something that looks entirely like noise into a spectrum if you just give it enough time and enough scans. OK, so <clears throat> normalizing XAS data. So here over on the right, I'm showing you a platinum L-edge spectra that were collected on two different samples. And these samples had the platinum at different concentrations. And so this was the signal that we got out of the detector. And what you'll notice is that the more concentrated sample gave you a lot more signal, as you would expect. Unfortunately, that makes it very difficult to compare what's happening between these two because the, the absolute intensities are very different. Now, something that's fortunate is if you look out here at high energy, you'll see that all these peaks and these bumps and these wiggles all kind of die out as you get to very high energy. It happens for both this spectrum and for that spectrum. And what that's telling us is that if you get far enough above the edge, an absorption of a platinum atom looks the same regardless of what the chemical environment is. And then that applies for every atom. If you go high enough above the edge, it doesn't matter what the oxidation state is, the geometry, anything. The absorption basically will look like a straight flat line. So what we can do is we can come far above the edge here, out where it's nice and flat, and we can say, okay, absorption out here, let's say that that equals one. And we can say that this equals one and this spectrum equals one. And if we multiply those spectra by values to make that happen, we end up with something like this. So the absorption out here for both is now one, and you'll notice the intensities now nicely overlay. And so because the intensities overlay, we can zoom in on the edge and we can actually see what's happening and we can um, assess uh, different chemical changes uh, that we see between these two platinum atoms. So normalization enables us to compare samples in different concentrations and from different environments. Okay, another thing that you might see in your data are glitches. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if you're taking a scan and you see a spike like this in your data and you take another scan and you see another spike, and a third scan, and another spike. Chances are that what you're looking at is what we call a glitch. And basically, it's just, it's an energy that the monochromator that chooses the energy of your x-rays does something funny. And so this red spectrum is the signal from the monochromator. And what you see is that everything looks fine. You hit that glitch, it's a spike, and then everything looks fine again. So if you see this in your data, you see a glitch, you look at the monochromator signal, you can safely remove that from the data because it's not, like this isn't real signal, and it will just mess up your analysis. So it's okay to delete it. If that spike isn't in every scan, or it changes position, then you can't remove it. And we'll talk more about this on the data talk next week. Okay, so now we have our data processed, they're normalized, they're ready to fit. Well, <clears throat> why do we fit data? Well, there's a couple things that we want to learn from fitting. The first is, how many absorption features? How many peaks do we have in this spectrum? What are the energies of those peaks in this spectrum? And what are the areas or the intensities of those peaks? Because if you, if you just look at this manganese spectrum here, you, know, you see that you have one transition here, you have something going on in the pre-edge, but it's hard to say much more than that. But when you fit the spectrum, you can actually see, okay, there's actually three peaks going on up here in the edge, and there's more going on in the pre-edge. If you zoom in on the pre-edge, there's actually quite a bit going on. And this is information you wouldn't really be able to see without fitting the data. <clears throat> and so fits allow us to extract a lot more information than you could just by looking at the spectrum. So here I basically just, this is the pre-edge, it's got two peaks and everything else is a background. And this is something that you guys will be doing today in your hands-on practical with Luis.
<clears throat> so, okay, we've gone through, we fit the data, we <clears throat> have pre-edge intensities and positions, what do we do with that? Well, probably the most straightforward thing that we can do <clears throat> is to compare those data to published data. So people have gone through and they've, you know, there's been a lot of X-ray absorption data published, much of it looking like scary tables like this, where people tabulate the uh, energies and the intensities of peaks uh, for various different compounds. And so what you could do is you could take your data and you could say, okay, <clears throat> it has a pre-edge energy of this value and an area of this value. So it's most likely an octahedral iron compound that's iron three, or it's a square pyramidal iron two compound. And so these kinds of tables are very useful for uh, analyzing your data that way. <clears throat> the other thing that's very neat is that XAS spectra <clears throat> can generally be calculated quite well using DFT. And so if you have an unknown species in your sample, what you could do is you could come up with hypothetical ideas of what you think that might be. You could calculate spectra for those, and you could see if any of those are consistent with your data. And if they're not consistent, you can throw out that hypothesis as not being consistent. So again, for most transition metals, these kinds of studies have been done. And so we know that the the theory matches quite well to the experiment. Okay, so then just to wrap up, uh, here's just some links for resources that I will leave in the slides, and then I will turn it over to you guys to see if there's any more questions. I don't see any questions so far. Yet. <laughs> Nope, still no questions. Okay, cool. Well, <clears throat> I put these slides on the box. So <clears throat> if anyone wants, you can go and download them and you know have these resources and everything. And if you have questions later on, our contact info is on this slide so you know how to reach us. So if there are no more questions, I will stop. And I guess, what time is it? It's 2.15 or so? Yeah. <clears throat> So do we want to take, oh, I, there was a chat from someone. Oh, they say, thank you. Oh, well, you're welcome, whoever that was. <laughs> thank you very much, Chris. Uh, that was very informative. Uh, uh, I think one of the main questions about here at SINS that I will have is uh, the, the pre-edge, mm -hmm. as you were talking about, um, depends on also on the, on the chemical, uh, the uh, environment that, uh, around the road up to yes. so is it a way to determine uh, geometry just by looking at that or not so just by looking at it typically no what the the type of analysis that is often done is if you have an idea of what your sample, what your species looks like, you can compare your data to existing data in known geometries and see what's most consistent. You know, we, <clears throat> from tables like this one, we know that if you have very low pre-edge intensities, that's indicative of a very centrosymmetric environment. So if you see that your data has a very low intensity pre-edge, without any further outside input, you know that it's probably a quite symmetric site that that atom is, is in. If it's a higher intensity pre-edge, that becomes harder to say without fitting and getting energies and comparing to other existing data or calculations. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's it. All right, well, how much of a break do you want to take, Luis? Because you're on next. <laughs> I don't know how much of a break does everyone need. Um, does anyone need to check on software and stuff? I do, I want to check on software. So how much time should we give, like 20 minutes maybe? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay. Yeah, that's